Beyond the Ring, a podcast that covers all things in the stock show industry from the informative to the insane, starring Ryan Rash. I am the rock therapists break themselves on. And Dale Hummel. Aim for the kneecap. Now on with the show. Welcome to Beyond the Ring. This is Dale Hummel, along with co-star Ryan Rash. Hello, hello, hello. Ryan, have you heard of anything called the generic ballot? Have you ever heard that term? Generic ballot? Generic ballot. I want to start Um, out with something positive this week. I have nothing positive for current events. I I have a lot of things that I'm very angry about. Very angry. I I do as well, but we're going to start on this. This email was sent to me by a good friend, and I'd never heard of the generic ballot, but it's a political poll which asks nothing about which candidate right now, if you had to vote for Congress, would you vote Democrat, Republican, or Independent? And at this point in time, there is a 10-point lead by the Republicans on, on just this generic ballot. There should be 100 There should. And in one poll, I think it was up to 14 points. The last time, I think when 2014, the Republicans had a pretty big win in Congress, I believe, at midterms. Guess what the generic ballot was for them at that point? And they, they flipped, I think, at least 13 seats. They had a 2.4 lead in the generic ballot. Currently, we're somewhere between 10 and 13 point lead. I if think I, we should have every seat in Congress. If I calculated correctly, it's going to be. If All it, of them. Now, can it change between now and then? Absolutely. No, not with this idiot in the minute running no, the things. No, no, it won't I change. I agree. No. If, if the Republicans still have a 10 point gener- plus generic ballot lead at next fall, I'm not saying, Ryan, it'll be every seat. But that would be the largest generic ballot lead any party's ever had going into a midterm. Not just absolutely huge. This person. So and that's that's good news, right? Other than I think it should be like fifty points, but sure. I agree. I agree. But at least we start on something positive. Now I have plenty of negative, but please you you jump in. I'm sure you have enough. So this man, I, I know he's the president, and I realize that, but I don't like to refer to him as that because it offends me. So this man running our country. <laughs> Or who they think is running the country. You're not referring to Oz, but rather Brandon. No, I'm talking to the actual person, Biden. So Got it. he is going to a $30 million mansion in Nantucket for Thanksgiving with his crackhead son and his wife and, I don't know, all of Hunter's illegitimate children. And they just left last night. Just bye. Go to, I'm going to my buddy... $30 million mansion in Nantucket. I got to go. Sorry that all of you people are suffering. And this is going to be the most expensive turkey day for all of y'all ever. I'm going to go like live it up in a $30 million mansion. I love it. You did You did hear, though, he was doing something for everybody. No. He's yeah, not he's, doing anything. Yeah, Don't no. even start on this freaking oil reserve thing. <laughs> How many billion, 40, 40 million barrels? Of, I don't know how. No, it's okay, not enough so to take, make. No, 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 no. So. He is telling people, like he's lying oh, to America. the most, the most. He's lying to them. He's saying that he tapped the oil reserves 50 million barrels of oil. Actually, it's only 32. Okay. Because there's 18 of them that already been out there or something. And it has to do with something that when Trump filled the oil reserves, by filled the way, they were all. empty. Filled them all. Filled them all. With, with cheap fuel. Right. Yeah, way cheaper than what it is now. When he filled them all, he put in something that, like, if gas prices got above a certain point, then he would release 18. Well, he, Biden didn't veto that. So that is the – anyway, it didn't matter whether it's 32 or 50, but he's a liar. Guess how much oil we use a day in America, Dale? <laughs> I, I don't know, but I know this is a – I know. <laughs> how much? 20 million barrels. Okay. So – even if it's 50, basically what he has done is two days, a little over two days. That's it. I, I think what he's trying to do is just a little bit of a, a blip downward pricing, which I don't know if it'll even happen. For two days. A, yeah, but a, no, a blip just before going into Christmas that he can point to for a little while. See, I've, I've got our prices back. I'm helping the people out. His He came out there. Biden comes and makes a statement, Ryan, this week that – his environmental friendly energy policy is not contributing to higher fuel prices. Nothing he's done is contributing to higher fuel prices. He cannot believe that. 
I don't know what this crazy old man believes, but I cannot believe that there are people. He has to have some form of intelligent life in his no, administration. No, I don't. He has to. Where? Have you, have you seen know. any signs of it? No, I haven't, but I know there's God's so how, how can we go from energy independent? Energy independence a year ago. To this, because of his policy changes, he changes where we are no longer energy independent, and he doesn't think that's affected the fuel prices? So, Daddy James, I, I, I could tell y'all crazy stories about my week, but maybe y'all will want to hear that later. But anyway, so Daddy James decides to drive to California because I have to go to Nash Vegas for a swine show, so I won't be here for the turkey day of it all. Daddy James drives to California. Do you know he had to pay over $7 one time for fuel? For diesel, I assume. For diesel. That's a lot. He's not very happy. No, you're probably going to be shorted on Christmas presents this he year. He's not very. No, I took care of all that yesterday. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So he, and so this man is going to get out there on the television and say, oh, I'm doing all this to help y'all. It's a little over two days. That's it. It's going to do nothing. And do, do you know how much the world, the world, one day, Oil, one day, 90 million barrels of oil. So this is going to do nothing. Nothing. My my other concern for this, I, I understand that we released some to try to bring fuel prices down to give the, the American public a little bit of a relief. But there think is about, going think, to be no relief. No, and think about the title of this. What is the title of this reserve? Emergency reserves, right? It was supposed to be for only used during wartime, and if there was a crisis. Well, we've had a lot of crisis. I guess we, we call qualify that. we're not at war. He, no, we, we, we he pulled us out of Afghanistan, remember? It was great. But Lovely. it does concern me that if he keeps bleeding, and I, I have no idea, if he, I assume he'll continue to release more to try to keep, I don't know what he's going sure to do he or what he's thinking, but I would like to have those supplies there for wartime emergency, especially yeah, with when, what's going on in the world. And Russia come after? Yeah, that might be nice. You brought it up, so I'm going to continue with it. Okay, you brought up go China. Right ahead. Mm-hmm. You, you they, brought it up at the show in the Grand Drive, too. You just couldn't help yourself last weekend. I, just, I couldn't. I could, just couldn't. You have to yourself. tell people about China. You just couldn't help yourself. Anyway, so go ahead. Joe has a, a meeting with President Xi. Four hours they're discussing things. Do you know how many times he mentioned COVID? I do not know. Or where COVID maybe originated or questioned? Not I'm going to say Zero. Zero. He has no intentions of pushing China whatsoever. Bounce over to Russia, China's newfound ally. They're building up their their troops on the Ukraine. There, there's no question what they're going to do. Have you heard anything out of the White House about it? Mm-mm. Occasionally, no. they try to ask, circle back a question, and she she runs from that as fast. She's just as she very can. defensive these oh, days. Like, she's very much on edge, isn't she? I, I don't think she's going to make it. Like no. much longer in no, this fight. No, like, no, no, no. She either gonna need a vacation, but well, when she had COVID, that poor little lady that stood in for her. They when when red goes off the brink in the deep end, like they gonna have to get somebody else besides that poor girl because she was so far in over her head it wasn't even funny. But yeah, I don't she, think. Yeah, she Saki's wasn't as cranky as is, is, is circle back. Not as cranky. oh no, she was just like. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> oh, she did it's, it with a smile, though. Did you? Did you see? Nice uh, tone. I'm sure it only came out on Fox, but they found another brokering deal with Hunter and, I believe, China. That they, while while Joe was vice president, he he managed to foster the sale of a cobalt mine that oh. was U.S. owned selling it to China because of all the solar panels and everything. The demand for cobalt is going through the roof, but it got, I mean, at least a minute of attention I noticed, but it just continues, Ryan. And in the buildup that the China has right now from weapons development, conventional hypersonic bioweaponry, everything that they're doing, military, economic, cultural, it's all of these things. They've, they've had a long-term plan and they've held to it. And unfortunately it appears to be working. And if we really knew how much they owned in this country and the influence they have because of the ground that they own and some of the corporations, packing plants, et cetera, that they own right here, I don't know if we need they need to go to war with us. They can they can take us over from within if we don't slow this this down. And right now, during the Biden administration, they are on full speed to take advantage of this administration as best they can and 
the White House is doing nothing. Oz is not even doing anything about this. Did you know that for the first time in history, a woman had the full presidential powers? Yes. 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 When it, Biden had to go under anesthesia, Camel Toe had the reins. She had them. I don't know what she did with them, but she did have them. I don't them. think she did anything, but she did. So that, that's <laughs> she did officially have them. Yeah. That, it was I didn't hear much about that, but I, I did catch a little blip on it. He had a colonoscopy, whatever, the, how do you say that thing? Colonoscopy. Yeah, and that you have to be under anesthesia. Basically, the first time a woman held the powers of the president is because Joe was getting his ass examined. So exactly. there you go. Exactly. You know, I, I, I did have an interesting experience on my way back from Mississippi, the, the cattle show that, that we were sorting down there. And, and we have to make mention of, of the one animal there, don't we? The one? Yeah, I was, I was I mean, glad I mean, that you agreed. You, you have to. I mean, I'm just saying, because after the, the heifer drive, I was a little worried. I was the most scared. So those of you that aren't weren't there, y'all get. I, I've got lots of pictures. But anyway, so if y'all don't know Dale's wife, Holly... She's a beautiful woman. I mean, drop dead gorgeous, stunning creature. Dale needs to put Holly's image in his brain when he sorts heifers. Maybe more because feminine than your mind. He picks them more looking like him than he does his wife. <laughs> we like function, function, uh -oh. sound, big body. So, if they don't have a dairy neck in them, it's okay. We it's had okay. some issues during the grand drive of the heifer show. It was very good, wasn't it? it, it, it we had some it was problems. The best. We worked it out. The best. Fairly. But I know the people that were watching on Facebook Live got great joy out of it. But anyhow, so then I told him after we got through that, so, okay, look, this thing coming in here in a minute, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> but if you don't find this one, like, I'm afraid I'm going to have to hurt you. And then here comes the majestic Brahmin bull, and Dale flips out and goes crazy. Oh, great he is, and thank God. So, yeah. Uh, ah, he's really good. And I, I don't, I, I'm going to That was confess. his 13th Supreme Championship in a row. I, I do not know where he fits into the international Brahmin world or anything like that, but that is an incredible creature. Beautiful. Incredible <laughs> creature. <laughs> really good. So, on, on my way home, Ryan, I fly from Jackson to Atlanta. I drove. Yeah, you great. drove. I, I flew. Took me longer to get home flying, by the way. So Jackson to Atlanta. I'm in Atlanta. I have an hour layover or so. I hate that airport. Um, yeah, you know what airport I like? I think it was on the way down there, Charlotte. North Carolina. I, yeah, yeah that that's nice. a nice airport, by the way. I, I really, really like that one. But I'm in Atlanta, and I'm just in the terminal area there at the gate waiting to get on. And this this may not this may generate hate mail, Ryan, but it is oh, what it is. Fabulous. And I, I look over and I see this guy, 20 something, with a hoodie on with his hood up. I'm not a big fan of hoods up inside. I just I'm just not. Maybe a little old school. I'm just not. And on the hood itself and on the front of the hoodie, it states in very bold print, Rob the Rich. Oh, that's special. Oh, it got my attention. It definitely got my attention. I'm thinking about this. You and have all not looting. even shared this with me. No, it's it's bothered you me. You have been though. a little preoccupied. I have. We won't talk about that part. Just now. <laughs> okay. So I, I see this, and I'm thinking the, all the looting that's going on, and everybody's breaking in and destroying these small businesses. In those people's minds that are out there trashing businesses, looting, whatever you want to call it. Riots. I mean, we have a lot of different terms. Yeah, peaceful sir. pro. While they're out peaceful there peaceful protesting, protesting, they see this small business. They think, well, these people have a small business. They have all kinds of stuff in their store. They must be rich. Let's just steal from them. They're rich. They don't need it. Did they ever once stop and think that maybe that small business owner has busted their ass all their life to get what they've got and to, to have that small business? And in one night, it's gone because of these damn thugs. Gone. Just absolutely gone. This hoodie, in my mind, is representing or justifying the looting of small businesses. Maybe I take it a little bit, maybe I dig a little deeper and my mind goes different ways, but that's how I read it. And it was it was very difficult for me not to approach the gentleman about that. I am very glad you did not. Because it, you probably would probably best. not be with us anymore. But um So I, I have an idea. And oh, I'm a, boy. <laughs> I do. I, I do. this one. 
I would like to bring Mr. Boxel in. He's been very good about some of this apparel. You know, you, you, Ryan, you and I, are, we're bad on the apparel side. We, we're not no, good. No, it just, I'm it just not, doesn't I'm work. I'm not good at it. Not. Okay, so <laughs> I'm asking Mr. Boxel right now. In order to combat Rob the Rich hoodies, hmm. I would like him to make some hoodies for me. Oh. Shoot the thugs. Oh, Shoot the thugs. Lord. Would you wear one? No, I don't wear hoodies. Shoot it's the thugs. Nothing against Mr. Boxel, nothing against whatever. I don't wear hoodies. It messes up. With but is that hair. not appropriate? Like you have to put them pull them over your weave and I spend a lot of time on my hair so <laughs> we like we can't do that. But uh I am sure you and Jonathan Mr. Boxel will just love this idea. And I mean I'm great. I'm open he he maybe can come up with a better slogan but that that's the He's best very I can creative. Come up with. He is. He's very creative. But I would like to combat this this rob the rich. That isn't that a little it's a good thing I didn't okay, have a gun. Okay, Rob the Rich. I, I think it's offensive. I, I, I agree. Like, it's a terrible thing. But, like, it, it's not any different than AOC and her gown at the Met Gala. Tax the rich. I mean, it's the same principle. No, I, other than that, I, I took it as a go ahead and break into those small businesses or any business and steal because they're rich. So you can you can steal from them. Even though they, they very well may be leveraged and borrowed everything they could to, to get that business started and, and keep it operational. It just – it made me very, very angry. I can only imagine. Very angry. But- very angry. I will say this. Like, well, first off, I have to go back to this man leading this country. So everyone knows that Rittenhouse got acquitted on all charges, and Dale was the most happy. I think he, like, screamed like a three-year-old girl. But anyway, He deserved to be acquitted. I, I agree. The boy deserved to be acquitted. I, I, I agree uh, completely. Do, I think people need to reconsider letting him have a gun all the time, but I'm, I'm going to let it go. I'm fine. Whatever. So, Joe... First, like when he gets asked about it, he says, we have to respect the jurors that the jury did their work. Then like two hours later, I I don't think he did, but someone in his office sent out a press release that basically what it said is that a lot of Americans should be worried and concerned with the verdict of the trial and angry as he is. Joe basically says he doesn't think they were right. You should be concerned. You should be angry. So go on out there and peacefully protest. Yes, he encouraged it. Yes, encouraged him. Now, what I what I want to ask you, Dale, which I already know what the answer is going to be. There were no riots, no looting, no peaceful protest in Kenosha. Very few anywhere. Now that stuff that's going on in California, that been that's been happening. That's not new. Yes, that, that's, that's not continual. That, that's that, just, that is not that's about called, this. That's called Christmas shopping. Christmas right. looting. <laughs> Right. That, but that has whatever. But I heard of, I saw none. I saw, not, there was the first night, there was a little bit of stuff in New York, but that was it. But like nobody, blo- rooted, blo- you know, broke into stores, whatever. They walked across the bridge and whatever. But like, so when the president encourages this, nobody does it. So what I want to know, do you think it is A, because they're afraid that they can get shot if they pull this shit again and the person will get off? Or B, because the supply chain crisis is so bad, there's nothing on the stores for them to take <laughs> worth the damn anymore. <laughs> I, I think it's both. I would like it to be more of A, but and I'm sure that's in the back of people's minds now because I'm telling it you, it has to be. If I own a small business and I am in, in front oh, of if that I business, own a small business in a downtown, I just shoot everybody now yeah. if they came at me because, like, literally, you're. I mean, th- th- what? And I think it's a good precedent, don't get me wrong. But, like, I don't think people, and, of course, the media is not talking about it because they don't want to. But this sets a precedent, a historical precedent. And it was self-defense. I mean, like, you can watch the videos. But I I just, I I could not, I was prepared for, like, summer of 2020 when George Floyd died all over again. No, you would have have thought. Now, I know that the, that... For this, not for the other riots, they could have brought the National Guard out there in Wisconsin before, and they they chose not to. They almost gave that permission to go ahead and burn and steal and pillage and everything else. They did bring the National Guard out this time when they wouldn't before. Trump was president before. Biden's president now. Maybe keep – I I don't know, but it's it's ridiculous on every every single level. Have you seen any of the interviews this kid has done since? I, I I didn't sit through the Did whole you interview. Watch the but one I've seen on a Tucker. lot of, I, I've seen pieces of it, and I was 
I, I haven't he, watched all of it. I'm but. impressed. Oh god, <laughs> I of course honestly you was. Are. He is very well coached on what he is to say. Yeah, because somebody's standing in front of him with cue cards. I don't know where they are or what they're doing, but he's or he I has love, a piece in his ear. I love when he throws it back on Biden for for malice. Okay, I, mean, just I think all he had a things. couple of nice one one liners, like he said that it's actually malice that yeah. Biden said all that. I, 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 yeah, but like if you will watch this boy, you can see him waiting to say the words. Like I think he there has an earpiece or somebody in front because like no, let's just be nice to Kyle. He 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 did a good deed, and let's I, leave it at that. I I think he should sue everyone in the media. I think he should sue Biden. I, I I think he should do all of that because I think he needs to make his money now. Be nice. I, I do not think there is a whole lot of brain cells in there. I don't know why you're up. so critical on Kyle. Oh, I <laughs> just don't. Man, he's just very not very intelligent in my opinion. But anyway. But I think he should sue. I would really like for him to sue the president. I think that would be great. I, I think that would be awesome. And I hope he wins. And But I was impressed that there was not nearly as much shenanigans as I thought there would be. I thought there would be much more. I uh, agree. How about, which I'm sure you have, this is the last current event I have. And then I'm sure you have something else. But anyway. Brian Laundrie shot himself. Correct. So, if y'all don't remember who Brian Laundrie is, he's the one that killed, what was her name? His fiance. Yeah, his fiance. And uh, anyway, so what I don't understand about this deal is the boy goes to the swamps of Florida and then shoots himself. That gun worked perfectly fine in his home, at his in his room at his parents' house. Like, why would we go out and, like, suffer and all this other stuff in the swamps and the Everglades, whatever, and then end up? Like, I, 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 don't, I do not know. I heard a little blip that, that something that maybe he faked it, or I, I don't think that. Obviously, they have DNA, and they know it's him. But I, I, I heard something. There was some spin on it, but I didn't catch it. Oh, no. I mean, I, they're saying it's him. Yeah, so no, I'm sure. I, don't I, 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 cannot, I cannot answer that. I don't, I don't know why. Maybe when he went out there, he thought, I I don't know what the crazy guy was thinking. I I just oh 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 I forgot one other thing. Talking about China, did you hear about the tennis star that they've got like the Olympic tennis star and they've got her held and hostage. they let her out for a quick photo shoot and then bring her back in? Right, they've got her held hostage and all this stuff. Like, oh this yes. is crazy. Yes, I hope something comes of it because I don't know what really her name need, is, but and the other the other thing I want to put out there, we're getting long. I don't remember the name of the basketball NBA player that puts those things on the shoes. Stop slavery in China. Stop the yeah. abuse. I appreciate that He's man punking LeBron James the most, though it's hilarious. Yes, I, I appreciate him. I am going to figure out what his name is, and we're going to talk about it next week. Okay, but anyway, so y'all don't think I'm crazy. There's this huge. Chinese tennis star, female tennis star. And so she had been missing, like gone missing because she had been talking out against the China Communist Party or whatever. And isn't it Beijing where the 2022 Olympics yes. are going to be? Okay. So anyhow, long story short, so they like snatch her up. She disappears. All these people are asking where she is, demanding whatever. So then they like put they bring her back out in this little video snippet saying, I'm fine. Like she's talking to the Olympic committee over there in China. I'm fine. I'm safe, whatever. And now she's like back in a torture chamber somewhere. Yeah. It's crazy. Crazy. It crazy. And at least it's getting a little bit of attention. At least. I mean, nuts. Well, before we go into the main topic, as usual, a sincere thank you goes out to Boxwell Manufacturing for the continued support of the Beyond the Ring educational podcast. Humble Livestock currently is a proud owner of three box of blowers and a show box on the way. Maybe to be a rash box. What do you think? I don't think, I mean, I doubt it because you really don't like purple and Craig likes purple less than you do. So I do not so think. Prob- probably not. I do not think. But you know, if, the, if, if, there's, if there's a discount on it, that sometimes overrides everything else. You, you never know. So there's a limited amount of time to get your equipment blower and or show box for Christmas. So please consider Boxel Manufacturing. If you appreciate this podcast and enjoy listening to it, give them a chance if you would, please. I just, I don't even, 
I would love to see you and Craig at a show with my. You would, you, would, you would like that when we get a picture with be, it. It'd be it'd be the best. I would the find it absolute the absolute best. The most funny. And so uh, I am going to give uh, one Beyond the Ring Junior Livestock Association um, shout out to. We have like I got three or four new sponsors, but I don't have their lo- logo back in and all this other stuff. So there'll be more. But uh, our national all around sponsor is Old Wood Limited. From Ohio, and they were the very first sponsor we had, and they wanted to do it, the national all-around sponsorship for us. And uh, it is, Oldwood Limited is one of the nation's largest manufacturers of custom-wide plank flooring and other unique reclaimed building materials. Their products will turn your project into a -a one-of-a-kind masterpiece that will last for generations to come. Everything is made right here in America. Please visit them online at www.oldwood.com. O L D E W O O D L T D dot com to create your dream home today. So want to thank those people at Old Wood Limited for being the national all around sponsor. Thank you, Old Wood Limited. We we appreciate that. We've had so much been so fortunate to have so many sponsors come in. This this is is going in a the exact direction that you would hope. And even even at a faster pace, I think, Ryan. So thank you to all of those sponsors that have jumped in, all the members that are signing up and the shows are getting their sanction forms in. And and again, we we have time to get those in, but it does not cost anything. Simply fill out the form, send it in, your sanctioned show. You do not have to change anything whatsoever. With that, keeping in the holiday spirit, our main topic today, things we can be thankful for in the stock show industry. Who came up with this one, Ryan? I don't remember. That would be me. Oh, that was yesterday, right? Yes. Dale is the most thankful for me. Duh. I am the most thankful for you for coming Duh. up with topics, especially when I'm distracted. <laughs> Do you want to tell people why you're distracted? I may as I'm well. Kidding. You're going to, aren't you? I'm going to if you don't. You say I, uh, I think it's very funny. I When we I got back from Mississippi, I had a down day or two before I was going to Canada to the Agribition to partake in the, the cattle show there. And I get home and I thought, well, I better get my things in order and make sure my passport's there, my vaccination card. I had to schedule a PCR COVID test and have everything in line so I could get into Canada and then hopefully back out of Canada without any problems. And I begin the process and I go to our safe and here's everybody's passport except mine. And the next day and a half, I proceed to turn the house upside down searching for my passport. And as of right now... It does not exist. And I am still in my home and not in Canada today. How's that for confession, Ryan? He found his expired passport. I did find my expired one, but I I officially have misplaced. And I'm very good at that. I can set something in a very safe place until I can take it down to the safe. And that safe place becomes so safe, I forget about where it is. And then I can't even find it. I'm the best at it. It's very, very. What what have you you been up to the last couple of days? Well, you better be thankful for it, by the way. I am the most thankful. So my parents, again, Daddy James drove to the California Sheree. I put Sheree on the plane this morning. Or actually, I dropped her off at the airport. And she's flying to the Californias. And they're going to have um, Thanksgiving with my stepbrothers and one of my stepbrothers' fiance, I think. I think that's it. I don't know. Anyway, I'm busy. I'm going to be in Nash Vegas. But, um, and so... uh. I don't know if I've talked about this on the podcast or not, but like when the snowpocalypse came, bad things happened to my parents' house. Cherie is on this big, huge renovation project. So they have like, they moved out and they've been renting this lake house and whatever. Long story short, that lake house was rented already for this week before they started renting it. And so she was officially homeless, like literally. <laughs> and so. I wanted to drop her off at a homeless shelter, but she didn't find me funny. So um, we came to Houston and we went Christmas shopping and it was very, 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 very festive. Very festive. I saw pictures. I saw pictures, Ryan. Santa does, may not like me, but Sheree, she liked me the most yesterday. So Christmas is going to be great. So and you, you then, wandered around the mall. Uh huh. In anything you decided you wanted, Sheree was happy to help out. Well, I mean, that's kind of the perks of being an only child. 
So, <laughs> just saying. Can you give uh, us a number? I, you know, no, I'm a number kind of guy. We're not going to talk about that. Okay. We're not right. going to talk right. about that. All right. It's a good thing but the oil prices is, are up. Yeah, she is uh, on her way to California. I am going to be going to Nashville. Dale is going to be spending time with his family at Thanksgiving because he can't go to Canada to buy any showcase. It's probably better I'm right here, and it just it, it just works. It's good. I'm 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 so, at ease with this. We're going to be fine. But uh, I did think I don't I don't even know if we I don't think we did a Thanksgiving episode last year. I mean I know we did one, but I don't think that was the topic. And so uh, I just thought like things that we're thankful for and the livestock industry or whatever be nice dale likes the warm fuzzy butterfly rainbow unicorn topic so here you go i've handed you one up so dale what are you the most thankful for about the livestock I, industry I, I have i have several things i don't know what i'm the most thankful for but if i had to start with the most thankful, besides I, me i would have i would have probably waited to the end for this one but i can i can take it right up towards the top so ryan maybe you and i ought to just keep it very simple that if I look at it in, in a manner, think about what the livestock industry has done for us. Our entire lives revolve around the livestock industry. I could not be more thankful for the fact that I have this opportunity, that I'm able to raise my kids in this industry. And I think we need to continue to fight to keep this industry strong and true to the purpose that it that has evolved to serve. So my my greatest thing is is just being able that the industry is still going strong, that I'm able to be involved in it at many levels, and more importantly, it's given me an avenue to raise my children. That is what I'm most thankful for. That is so sweet. It's good. Now I have many many other things that that I can bring up, and there's there's one that I also I so I don't forget it because I'm I'm capable of forgetting things very quickly. I've noticed, and Ryan, maybe maybe you'll disagree with this, but over the past year, year and a half or so at the shows, and you would be able to tell better than anybody, but I see more American flags in the show ring, and I find that more shows are conducting the national anthem at the beginning than I've ever seen in the past. I would agree with that completely, especially at the jackpot show yes. level. You I mean, you're used to it at the majors. We're, we're not as used to it outside of there. But yeah, when when they're when they have the flag in the middle of the ring at a jackpot show and they play the national anthem at the beginning, that I don't remember that at jackpot shows in the past. I'm not saying it doesn't I do exist, not, but not in a very I large mean, number. Yeah, no, but and I would I'm like and like some people like at most of these shows that I go to that are jackpot level, like the one this last weekend we just did pledge. We didn't have anybody saying or but I mean they do something, you know, like we pray, we national anthem, we pledge. And there's a flag, and like that is definitely something that is way more prevalent now than it has been before. Those those small efforts they put out to show respect to the flag and what it stands for, it just sets up the day to be really good. I mean, I I, I am truly thankful that we're on that trend and we're going that direction. One of the things that I am the most thankful for about this industry is uh, like the thousands of people that I have met. I I just and, and and even the messages I get, whether they're text or Facebook or whatever, just like people thanking me for doing what I do and all this other stuff. But meeting all those people, I know at times y'all probably think that I don't enjoy it or whatever and stuff like that. Because when I'm at, when I'm out of show to judge or whatever, I'm trying to I, uh, the way my brain is to try to focus. But I really do enjoy getting to meet all the kids and all this other stuff and everybody that sends me things and to, you know, whether it's a message or whatever and appreciates what I'm trying to do out here. I really, really do. I'm very thankful for all of those people out there and to all these shows giving me the opportunity to get to work with the kids and sort their shows and all that. I really very, very thankful for all that. And then, I know I've said this in different ways on here. I don't know if I've said it just this way, but I, I am very thankful to this industry for allowing me to have the courage to do this. Because if I wouldn't have been brought up in this industry, I don't think I would have had the courage to just be exactly who I know I am and want to be and think that I can be a success regardless. And so, I attribute all that to growing up in this industry and knowing that 
I can do anything I want to be if I just put my mind to it. And, uh, and so I, and I know that happens for other people. So that is something else that I am very thankful for within the livestock industry. No. And and it's, it really is that, that deep or that strong, Ryan, that, that we have been involved, involved in this and it, it truly has impacted every, every step of our life. And thankfully we're both still able to be involved. And I hope that that continues for quite a while. You brought up being thankful for those those people that you meet and sending a quick thank you note for judging a show. I hadn't mentioned this to you yet because of the passport ordeal. I've been a little distracted the last day or so, so we haven't communicated much. But I had a call from an older gentleman in Ohio yesterday, and he was calling just to say thank you to you and I for doing the podcast and educating the youth and doing something giving back something positive for the industry. I took it very with, with a lot of sincerity and, and it make it made me feel really, really good. And, and those things go a long ways, not just when you're at the show, but when they, they reach out afterwards and I'm not always the best at checking all the Facebook messages and things like that, but, but those are appreciated. And I think it's, it's a part of our industry that is really positive. We, we have raised people in this industry to be respectful to be appreciative, to express their thanks. Everything that, that this industry has evolved into is very, very good for our, our children and as they go into adulthood. I want to do everything that I can, and I'm sure Ryan the same, to keep that industry true and keep it strong. I, I th- agree with all that. And, and I, I think one of the biggest things that Rona just shook so much up, not just in the junior livestock world or the livestock industry, but like everything. And so everything is, has a different thing. I think that we as an industry got through it pretty unscathed. And that was impressive on my, for our part. But I also think that it has changed us in a way that while we are very appreciative of what we are doing and what we're trying to accomplish here with these kids and everything else, we also now, I do think there is an undertone out there that we all want everything to be better. And maybe it's because we had to do different things to have shows and now there's more competition. I don't know. But like, I do think that there is an overwhelming push that we can all be better and we need to do better. Uh, I don't think we've got there yet. But I don't remember as many people talking about the things that need to change or that they want changed or asking, how do we make this happen? And I I, I have seen that change over the past year or so, and I am very thankful for that. And I think, as you just stated, I think that our youth industry, our youth activities probably came through the pandemic better than most. I'm not saying there weren't shows canceled. But people went above and beyond to make it happen. And that speaks volumes in, in my mind on, on our industry and what, what it's capable of doing. And less disruption during, during the pandemic is, is – it was, it was good. It was interesting how they found a way to continue to keep those shows going. Not every one of them, but there sure was more good coming through there than the negative considering what was going on in the world. So I, I think there's, there's youth development on all levels with our industry and a couple of them that, that Ryan and I, and, and many talk about, especially on the microphone when we're talking to the, the, the families and the youth during that grand drive is things like personal responsibility. It, it's real simple. And I think about how other kids are being raised and some are involved in, in sports. And I think there's a lot of good that can come from that. And there's a lot of different avenues, but I don't know if there's one that's quite as useful or quite as, able to develop children as well as what this one does. And I'm sure they're out there. I'm just not familiar with them. But the fact that we can combine so many things that are lacking in today's youth in personal responsibility is going to be one of them at the very top. Work ethic is going to be there. Attention to detail. All these things come into into play. If these kids are passionate about what they're doing, and most of them are, they wouldn't be showing, they have to develop these skills if they're going to succeed. So it's almost a drive from within that they're learning each and every day and putting more effort out to try to, to try to get to that, that successful level they would choose to be at. And, and it's, it's works. We, we've seen it 
for for decades. So allowing youth a path maybe to, to foster their passion then allows them to work on detail, to work on their their ability to get up that early and work that late at night, all the things that come with work ethic and that personal responsibility. If I don't do this, it's probably not going to go well. Well, I definitely believe that this is the greatest youth program in the world. I do know that there are others that do good things, but I think those things that you just talked about, the different attributes and skills that you learn growing up in a show barn and in a show ring, those are the things that are make these kids different. And I think it's what's makes them more successful. And again, while you and I are still involved in the livestock industry and it's what our daily lives revolve around, not every person that grows up showing is going to stay involved in this. But if they will remember and take the skills and attributes that they learned while in this program and apply it to what they're passionate about, then again, they'll be the leaders and the changers and the movers and the shakers and whatever it is that they've decided to do with their life. But it will be because, to a great deal, of the things they learned while in this program. Absolutely. There's no question it's, it's there. And and I'm going to say the vast majority of kids showing probably go into other industries and, and maybe take a job that's not directly related to this, but those skills, and we've talked about this and everybody's known this for a long time, but sometimes we need to take a deep breath and just appreciate what this is doing for these kids. And I, I think I talked about a little bit this weekend in Mississippi that I don't know if there's ever been a time that these kids that were out there in the show ring that are showing every weekend or, or wherever across the country because of the skills that they're learning, the responsibility that they're taking upon themselves, all of these things, there is a greater distance between them and the average of the populace of their age. In other words, other kids out there right now, I think, are expected to do less and have more expectations of entitlement. In other words, they just expect it. And it's worse now than I've ever seen in my lifetime. But the upside of this is the fact that we still have these kids coming through the stock show industry that have the work ethic, that have the passion, that have the drive. They have all these attributes that could be used in any industry or any job they go into or small business they decide to start, whatever it may be. And to their advantage, the rest of the kids their age that they're going to be competing against, they're not doing much, Ryan. It, it's a little bit sad. I'm not saying everybody out there, but there's a bigger gap right now, and there's more opportunity for those of you that have that work ethic and have the desire to get out there and get ahead than there's ever been before. And that's a good thing for kids coming through this industry. For our country, maybe not so much, but on an individual basis, really good. I agree on that. Uh, and as we continue to work through all this madness that is our country right now, politics is going to change and stuff like that. But I, I do think that there is just such a huge divide between the people that really, really, really want to be successful and the people that just want to survive. Uh, like a bigger, bigger divide than ever before. And I, I, I'm... I, I am not smart enough to understand why that is, but I see it everywhere. I think, I think it's even more so. Remember we talked about the Republican versus Democrat political divide, how it's separating our country. And I talked about a little bit about the, the city population versus the rural population kind of falling along those same lines. I'm not so sure, Ryan, to a certain extent. And again, it's not, not 100%. But those that are willing to work harder and do what they can to get ahead or put them in a position to get ahead – versus just do what we need to get by, guess what? I think they fall along some of those same lines. I'm a little biased, maybe. No. I, 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 but that I, there's a divide that, that continues. The separation continues on multiple levels. It's not just how you're voting or what you claim is your political party. It goes so much deeper. No, I, I want to say this publicly because I know I give Dale a lot of shit on the podcast and in person, and I make fun of him and all this, but... I am extremely thankful to Dale Hummel for coming up with the idea of having this podcast and dealing with me some days and sometimes, because I'm not the easiest one to deal with. I'm just going to be honest. <laughs> but um, I, I know, look, I know my flaws, okay? I'm very good at it. But I, when we started this, 
I had no idea that it could have the impact that it has had. And uh, I didn't come up with the idea Dale did. Not only am I thankful that he did come up with that idea, but like I I interact with Dale daily now in some way or another. And uh, I really appreciate the friendship and the bond that we have. Uh, Again, we don't agree on everything and that's okay. But I I think the best thing is, is that we can agree to disagree and do it fine. And it's okay. Like, it's not like we're going to stroke out and die, but the reach that this podcast has and uh, the things that I know and other people know that we have enacted positive change in the junior livestock industry through this podcast that is something that I, I just didn't foresee, and Dale did. And I am so grateful to him for allowing me to be the other person involved in this and uh, for coming up with the idea and also for putting up with me. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that is very, very sweet, Ryan. Thank you. Very thankful. Very, yeah, very sweet. And it, it is good, Ryan. And and I've had people, and I think you may have had a, or even early on in the podcast that what this has done for me, and, and for the most part, it's our daily interaction, not necessarily that the podcast, but we're having obviously interaction on a daily basis where prior to the podcast, we may touch base once a week or, or whatever it was. But I I am far more open about a lot of things and willing to speak out, whether it be politically or just personal opinions on other things, where prior to this, I was politically pretty silent, did not share my my opinions or views maybe publicly, definitely within a small circle. But I think at this point, when we think about where we're at in the world, not only the, the, the junior livestock industry, but just the world in general, that I'm afraid that we're in a position that if we don't speak up, those that are speaking much louder that may be the minority are getting way too much control. And, I, and Ryan, you have brought that out of me, no question. From a very much, I would say, a little more quiet and very, very conservative to now, I don't think you've changed the conservative part, maybe even strengthened it, to just being willing to to share my opinion and not be as concerned about maybe the hate mail you're going to get or some of the negative that's going to come back, but rather just just stand up for what's right. Be yourself, and here it is. Thank you for that and your friendship. It's It's been good. It's been good for me. It's, it's grown me from a, a standpoint of just – not being so closed up and, and tight with, with everything that I am doing or what I think. I just cannot believe that you were ever quiet about politics. As loud as I opinionated was not. and all this as you are. And I know you are. And I mean, like, people don't. I just, uh, I just, I, I'm shocked. Because, like, I probably, maybe I have reduced your anxiety level. Because now that you talk about it out in the open, like, maybe. it's not bit end up in you anymore. That's that is possibility. It is it is possible. <laughs> because so, you like to get it out. <laughs> I I agree. No, it's it's been good and 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 I share the the feelings that Ryan has with when we get information back, whether it's the fact that they decide to put a flag up in the show ring or that we made a rule change at a county fair to make it better. And the fact that maybe it was initiated through something we said that is rewarding, maybe more rewarding than than just about anything that I can I can think of in, in the related to the podcast. When that happens, or we get feedback that hey, we we were able to do this or that, or we had our county fair board listen to this particular episode, it it makes you feel good that that we are making a difference, and I hope we can continue to do so. We we have the opportunity to continue this, and I don't think Ryan and I have any intentions of not, as long as we can continue to find that hour each week to to get together to record this, and the listener base that we have wants to continue to listen, which we need to be very thankful for all of you out there listening. It's it's gone way beyond anything we could imagine, and, and it is appreciated, very much so. Yeah, and that was kind of my final note. Like, I don't plan on stopping. I, I thought, I <laughs> when Dale was having all his passport issues, I was like, Damon, I'm going to have to do this by myself again this week because he's going to be on a plane to Canada. But uh, I'm glad I didn't because I did not like talking to myself that one week. It it did not work well very very well for me. I think it went over fine. It's just a little more difficult. It's very awkward when you're talking to to nobody. I'm just saying. But uh, I do not plan on quitting. 
again, we've expanded with the first ever nationwide All Species Junior Livestock Association that starts January 1st. And I know that we're making a difference, and it is because of all you people that listen. And uh, it's just so overwhelming to me because it does not matter where I go in it or if I'm at home every day. Someone says something to me somehow about we listened to podcasts and because of what we heard on the podcast, this happened. Whether it was a change in their daily care of their animal or like Dale said, a rule change at a county fair, a jackpot show or having the national, whatever it is. But every single day that happens to me. And it is because of all you people that listen. And so I'm, I'm very grateful for it. I hope that you continue to listen because I promise you, and this is going to sound like bragging, and I'm not trying to do that. There are a handful of people that are very, very scared at the reach that this podcast has and that we are making change happen to better this industry. And they know who they are, and I know who they are. And with you listeners behind us, they won't be able to stop us. And so that's kind of my final note there. Very good. I do, I do have a public service notice, Ryan. A public service announcement? It does, and, and it's one that we all need reminded of at times. And it, I don't know if it's going to be popular or not, but I'm, I'm just going to say it. Um, hate mail, hate mail. No, hate this, mail. this will be okay. I think, I think this will be good. I, I, I do. I just know that sometimes we get caught up in trying to win that banner and how important that banner is and to have success at the county fair or the state fair or the national show. To all those parents that are out there listening, remember who you choose to expose your kids to and seek for outside assistance gives those same people the stamp of approval in the eyes of your children. If you do not approve of your child growing up to be like them and conducting themselves like those people you're surrounding yourself with and your kids with, then maybe you need to stop and just rethink it. That banner is pretty important, but more importantly is we continue in this industry to surround our kids with the best possible role models we can. Because believe it or not, when you bring those people into your life, whether it's a breeder, a broker, a fitter, um, any anybody, we need to stop and think, are these the ones that we want to use or want to give our stamp of approval for in front of our children because they're going to have an influence and impact on their life. And I have to stop and think about it every time we, we make a hiring decision for an employee, every time we go to a show and maybe bring somebody else on to assist other families. And it's something that I've, I've tried to become very conscious of. And I just want to remind those out there, think about what reason we're in this industry and I want to win and I want to be more competitive than anybody, but let's not do it at the sacrifice of who we're exposing our children to and try to try to surround those children with a good group. And 99% of those people out there are really good, but like any industry, there's going to be some that maybe aren't the best role models. So let's, let's put some thought into that. Is this why you don't like me going to goat shows, Dale? <laughs> this was not directed <laughs> anything at you. <laughs> Nothing. But when you do go to goat shows, you have – when you go to any show and you're watching the show, I don't recommend you ever do it again. It's, it's terrible for you, me. You it's pace. Nice. Your anxiety level is – It's very terrible. It was – It was. A, I think it was challenge, challenging it, for you. It's, 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 it's very hard for me to do. I appreciate you were there to, to support support my kids and to kind of watch the show and things, but I know it was hard for you. It's it truly hard. was. It's very, very difficult. But I do think what you said, everybody needs to listen to, and it's a point that I've never brought up before. But, it, I mean, we've talked about it. I just don't think that it's happened. But, yeah, there's more than just one person that can get you to have success in this deal. And uh, just like what Dale said, if you don't want your kid to be like that person in the end, probably let's not support them and put our children around them. And uh, I, I think that's something that needs to be brought up and needs to be thought about more. More than ever before, it needs to be thought about. You can take that whichever way you want, but it, it is something that you need to think about. And I, I, I can say from my personal perspective, I know a lot of people that don't wouldn't want their kids around me because I'm gay, and that's fine. I understand it. That's their that's their viewpoint, whatever. 
but you never understand the impact that people that are around your children have. It's just something that you won't ever see till later. So remember that and think about that. Absolutely. Are you ready for your favorite part of the program? Well, I am, but I do have one other BTRJLA sponsor that I want to put in. And so Tracy Beetle and the South Texas Show Series, uh, they kind of went crazy generous on us. And they're the first sponsor that we had that sponsored at all three levels. They're a national top 10 jacket sponsor. They're the region three sheep sponsor. They're the Texas sponsor for hog and cattle. They just, uh, she just stepped up and went way above what anyone could ask for. Their show series, it's been going on since 2007 and it's in there in Kingsville, Texas. They have three Shows a year that are all species, and at these shows, you people up north will not believe this, but there are four rings of steers, heifers, lambs, goats, pigs at this show in a weekend. I know most people are like, what? Yeah, and they do this three different times a year, and uh, we greatly appreciate their support of this association, and we hope that y'all will support them. And uh, their show's open to anybody. Kingsville's pretty far down south, but if you people from other states want to go, I'm sure she'd more than welcome you. They have shows in September, November, and December. And so I greatly appreciate Tracy and the South Texas Show Series gang for all their support of the BTRJLA. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Tracy. That, that is impressive. Very, very much appreciated. Question one comes from Scott. I have a question that I'd like to hear your opinion. At a jackpot show, do you feel a champion market animal should be at market weight? For a little more detail, we were recently at a small goat show, and there were mostly local showmen and a couple circuit showers. The Grand and Reserve went to the circuit family. My issue is the champion market weather was 70 pounds and the reserve was 52 pounds. They were good-looking animals, but not market ready. Uh, A jackpot show is just that. I don't care if it's market or breeding. It's it's a jackpot show. And so... I think this is something that why I appreciate what he's saying and I understand his point. You just pick the best animal that is there. That's how I firmly believe it should be, regardless of weight, regardless of age. Uh, And we've even brought in size into this. And sometimes I think you just use the highest quality animal there and throughout the show all, all the way through. When you were at a fair or a show that is supposedly terminal or has a terminal endpoint, then yes, I think market weight is something that should be taken into consideration. There are shows that have even like some county fairs in Texas and across they don't the animals don't die, but there's an auction involved. They can sit they want you to consider that to be the endpoint for that animal. And so when that is there, yeah, but not at a jackpot show at all. I couldn't agree more. I think there's a little bit of a mindset difference between the North and the South where you're very, I think people in in Texas and and even Oklahoma and and some other states are more accustomed to what you just said, Ryan. We just picked the best one there. Where it seems like in the North, there's a little more mentality that it's either a preview prospect show or a market show. And it's, it's not as common or it hasn't been historically to just bring them all in. I think we should bring every age, every size. The more times those kids can get in the ring, the better. So I'm with you. Find that best animal. And if you want to take it back, let's say this wasn't a jackpot show. Say it was a terminal show. We're looking at it goats at 70 pounds for champion and 52 pounds for reserve. If we want to talk about them not being market ready, we need to reel back just a little bit. There's such demand for goat and lamb and a lot of things right now, but particularly goat, they'll take them at any weight. They'll take a goat at 20 pounds. They'll take a goat at 150 pounds. They don't care. They're going to take them any time. But traditionally, when supply wasn't so restricted, their ideal weight, commercially speaking, going to the packing plant is in that 50 to 60 pound range. So guess what? Those goats that we're using that are 90, 95, 100, 105, whatever you may have in your head, those are not the packing plants are taking them and they're thrilled to have them. But their ideal weight, traditionally speaking, the ethnic groups that are purchasing the goat meat, they'd like those in a 50 to 60 pound range if we can. So in theory, that is a market weight. 
So we've got to just stop. And and again, I've said it many times. I I say there is no commercial goat industry. That way I can justify breeding zoo-like creatures that have no function and no practicality to them whatsoever, but they look really cool. They look like livestock rather than a goat. But that is that is in opposition to, to any of the other species when I, when I come in and, and put my wrap my mind around what kind they should be. But let's let's be careful because market weight is much lighter than what we perceive it to be in the show ring. And on, on a side note, I also want to point out that, I, and I'm, I don't think I'm the only one that will say this, I think that market readiness is probably more important than weight when Correct. you're doing one of those things. And you can have an 1,100-pound steer that's just as got as much finish on him as a 1,400-pound steer. Now, that's probably not a good thing, but, I mean, it is there. And so market readiness is probably as important or should be as important or more important than actual market weight. So Very good. Well, Scott, I hope that answers your question. The next one comes from Angelia. Question for the podcast. How do you guys feel about judges judging national or state shows, knowing that they are going to have animals there of their own and using them for grand overall? This one can go deep. You want to talk about some hate mail. And I, I, I don't have any problem addressing this because I, and Ryan, maybe you haven't recently, but I, I'll be at shows and I'm going to say that, that a percentage of the time, uh, probably at less than half, there will be something show up that was an animal that I raised. My thing is, okay, <laughs> how did we get here? That, that, that's, that's, that's what I want to know. Like, how is this possible that this is a question? And I know, I understand that this happens, okay? But I think the bigger question is, how did we get to this point? Agreed. I mean, I don't think that there is any doubt on the timing of this question, and I'm not going to go into that, but the overwhelming answer is it's absolute bullshit. You don't, <laughs> you don't do that. Uh, you don't do that at a county fair, at a jackpot show, at a state fair, much less a national show. You you don't use your own animals. You don't do things like that. I, no one can control who shows to you, and I, I don't. I I do not know any person that raises animals that I mean that one has shown to them, and people blamed that judge for having animals they raised or sold shown to them because you can't control that. You can control. What happens in the ring when you're the judge? It's a travesty. It's terrible. It's sickening. It makes my skin crawl. I could go on forever. But I think the bigger question is, how did we get to this point? And how do we allow people in the ring to sort the shows that would do something like this? It's 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 real, guys, and and I, I I don't understand it, and and I understand that those wanting to hire judges for the show sometimes some of the more qualified people may be those that are in the industry every day and raising those. They're going a, to be. That's yeah, I mean that it just that's it just common is. sense. If you're in a situation where we sell goats everywhere in the country, and it's very difficult for me to go to a show and not have one show up under me. I don't have control of that, but I'm going to be very honest and very open right here. I, I believe, well, at Mississippi, there there was one that that had one of our ear tags in, and a family that had purchased brought brought that goat to us. Um, ends up second in class, probably. But one also, of I was supposed to be judging goats, and there was a True. last minute. Change. Yeah, so, so I mean, it, I mean it, I'm it, just it, saying, and nothing against that family at all. But no. I'm just going to give everybody heads up, and and I can't control what does or doesn't come. And I I get it. I I try to avoid those areas where I where I'm convinced there's a very competitive one, that family, I don't want to take it away from them being able to show. So more times than not, I'll try to turn that show down knowing that, that if I go to that show, that family is either not going to bring one to me or they're probably not going to get along as well as they could if they do bring them to me. And that's what Ryan's saying. You have the control as a judge what to do. I've made it fairly clear that it's perfectly fine if you bring one to me to jackpot show or something like that, but don't to get that experience, but don't expect it. It's, it's going to be very difficult for me to use that one, if that makes sense. And I'm I've been at two shows where Dale had goats there, and he put them way lower than I, what I would have. And it just it just is what it is. We we can't we can't we we have to to make sure that they're they're 
maybe a, a place or two lower just so we're not giving that advantage. And, and heck, if it's something you raise, it's probably something you like or it's your type. So we have to be conscious of that. But I, I think Ryan hit it perfectly. How did we get to this this point? I was going to bring Eric That's Fugate That's the bigger out. injustice it is. in my opinion. It, it absolutely is. And I think I shared this with you, Ryan. I talked to Eric Fugate about this, one of our, our previous guests. And You're going to re- give away a topic. All right. Well, then maybe, should we just hold it? Yes. Okay, we won't. Hold Eric, it. you're gonna have to you're gonna have to to share this at some other point, but it's good. So we we just have to think about it. And I was approached at Mississippi um, about different judges that had, had been down to Mississippi and used different animals that maybe they were had raised or very closely tied to. And we we've got to we've just got to do better. And I know it's hard for show officials that are hiring the judges to know everything, but we just have to work a little bit harder. And we have to do just a little bit better. And okay. again, we don't have control over what comes to us, but we do have control over what we're using. But th- there is one thing about that. I-, I do think that the people that are making the hiring decisions, they do need to do a little more research. But I- I'm going to throw this back on you and me and everybody else that's listening to this right here. A lot of times we know when these situations happen or have the possibility of happening. Now, you can't do anything before because you've got to see what that individual does out there in the rain but if it does happen just like this question is it is every single person's responsibility to go to whoever is in charge of that show and say hey this is what happened right here this doesn't need to happen again because bitching at the backdrop or behind the scenes to your buddies or whatever that's not going to change anything and i know people don't want to go up there and don't want to say anything because they think oh it it's going to be like I have sour grapes or I'm pissed that I lost and all this other stuff. And I don't want that to negatively affect my kid because I'm walking up there and telling, you know, the grand poobah of whatever big ass show this is, whatever. If you don't do those things, that person's going to continue to get to judge. Maybe the next time they don't do it, but you don't know. Do you want to take that chance? No, I agree, Ryan. And, and this question, I thought about And whether- one person can, it's got everyone, so many people know, and so many people see, and so many people want to say stuff, but they don't want to say it to the right people. Agreed. And rant. I've I've held back, this, this th- not from Angelia, but we've had several people submit questions like this from the very beginning of our question and answer, and I've, I've avoided it for, for various reasons and, and trying not to offend anybody. But over the, the past year, that question is written very similar to this has popped up more and more. And here the past last time I, I went to check for, for question and answer, it was probably submitted by four or five different people worded just a little bit different. And it's not just one species. It's across species. It's, it's, it's out there. It needs to be corrected and we need to do a better job period. But with as many that have come in, I thought we'd finally throw it out there and, and not trying to necessarily offend anybody. But I think as, as Ryan summed it up, we it doesn't do any good to complain at the backdrop and be upset, but simply a very professional conversation or a message to that superintendent or who's ever the show official, maybe that will enact change and we won't have to worry about it in the future. That's all you can do. I mean, that's literally the only thing you can do is when you see Stuff like that happens. You have to alert the people that make the hiring decisions. I mean, because obviously they didn't know that was a possibility or they would have never put that person in that position to begin with. So, Agreed. Question number three. I had four, but we're only going to do three, Ryan. I know you'd you'd kind of – you'd probably call the union boss on on that fourth one and be in trouble. (laughs) Hey, fellas. Love the podcast. This comes from Ryan. Not this Ryan, but a different Ryan. <laughs> I have not submitted I, a question. I binge listened to every episode here in the last couple months. My boys have exhibited tears since they started 12 years ago in goats the last four. They have decided to focus on goats, so I have an open cooler room. My question is, is there a benefit for goats to stay in the cooler for hair growth or weight gain? Is there problems with more fungus? Will they just fall apart on a hot show day? What temp do you recommend? In South Dakota, it ranges from 110 to negative 30. Thanks, and look forward to your insight. Uh, I, I don't – I'm going to refer to the goat guru on this because I don't think putting them in cooler rooms is probably a good idea. I, I, I don't know. I think, I think not maybe in a traditional sense like you would a steer. 
but I, I can't, I mean, there's not many people doing it. So there's not a lot of data that you can actually pull on or experience. We have never put them in our, our cooler room for various reasons. We, is your we, goat barn even climate controlled? It is heated, oh, it not, is? not air conditioned. Not air conditioned. So, I mean, heat, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in the, in the summer, we, I mean, it's insulated. So it's, it's about it's got 10 fans degrees. and stuff, yeah. but. 10 yeah. degrees lower than what it is outside is, is where we're at. And and to me, on the, the Ryan, on the hot, the other Ryan, on, on the temperatures getting pretty warm, goats seem to handle the heat better than our other show species. But there's no question in my mind, if you went to a cooler room and possibly with melatonin or without melatonin or just turning the lights on or off, adjusted the photo period, as we do sometimes when we have cattle in the cooler room, I think you're going to grow more hair. I think all those things will happen. Is there more problems with fungus? There's going to be no question. You're in an right? environment that's going to be more inducive. So it, it's probably going to be there. Okay. Um, will they fall apart on a hot show day? Probably not as much as a steer, but yeah, I, I think I think you're going to have to do the same things. Let's back that temperature down as we get closer to to taking those animals out so they don't fall apart quite as bad. What temperature do you recommend? I'm going to take a, a bigger picture at it. I don't know if I go in the cooler room like you would with a steer, but if it gets extremely hot, I think taking the edge off, let's let them get up to 80, 85 maybe. And let's not get it, let it get too cold in the winter time. But let's find that window of acceptability rather than taking them to extremes and keeping them in a, a very narrow window. But let it fluctuate a little bit. But taking the edge off in those hot days, for example, Ryan in Texas over the summer, those goats that that are not climate controlled, they're not growing very well. It's too hot. Their intake goes down. They they just slow down quite a bit. If we need them to grow through the summer, I think put them in some type of climate controlled situation where we don't let it get above 85 or 90. And I, and I think you're going to get a lot of benefits from something like that. So Ryan, for, for, I guess, trying to answer your question, I think there's probably some benefits to it. You're going to need to do a little experimenting and uh, be happy to, to love to hear from you in a year if, if you do go that way. But I am convinced taking the edge off the extreme cold, taking the edge off the extreme heat, no question beneficial. Full-fledged cooler room, just like you would a steer, probably going to run into a few issues but but maybe you can work around them cool i, I was going to refer to you because i don't know i just thought the fungus issues would be like the problem but I, if he does it i do want him to like call us back or write us back no, and let us great. know how that how that works that'd be great to know well ryan with that again everything that we're thankful for in our industry i am very thankful for you even your mother sheree and, and daddy james for keeping you on path on occasion <laughs> Um, but it's been enjoyable. Hopefully we'll have many more Thanksgivings that we can can be thankful for and, and talk about what we're thankful for in our industry, and maybe it'll be a, a tradition that, that evolves. Until next week, happy Thanksgiving, and be safe. All y'all have a happy Thanksgiving, and y'all come back now, you hear? 